the last paper of this session by Simon Yeager on labor in the boardroom. Hello. Thanks a lot, everyone, for um, coming and uh, greetings from California. Um, you can see, I think, in the background, it's... Uh, oh, that's it's very early here. for you. Uh, I, I, exactly. I didn't expect you to be eight times behind. Sorry about that. That's all good. Um, delighted to be here, um, on the contrary, and start the day bright and early. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So this is joint work with um, Benjamin Schulfam, who's um, on this call as well, and um, member of CPR as well, and Jörg Heining at the Institute for Employment Research. And uh, it's a paper on labor in the boardroom, co-determination or shared governance. So at a broad level, um, we're interested in um, the consequences of shareholder versus stakeholder control of firms. So in liberal market economies, um, borrowing the terminology from Hall and Suskis, owners, for example, the shareholders control firms. For example, in the UK, shareholders elect the board of directors and the board of directors then has a fiduciary duty um, to the shareholders and runs the firm on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And we will compare and contrast this type of governance system of firms with an alternative model. And the alternative we'll look at in contrast with um, shareholder control is an alternative model in which owners and workers share the governance of firms. And examples of that system um, exist, for example, in Germany or in Finland and several other continental European Scandinavian countries. So, what we're interested in is situations where workers have half or share partial control rights. So workers have votes on corporate boards alongside the representatives of the owners. It's different from, for example, employee ownership, where workers are either like a fully a cooperative or workers get shares um, in that here, workers have some of the, get some of the boards, uh, board seats but do not, at least the jury, through this institution directly, have a claim to profits. Now, I know there have been um, recent policy proposals in the United Kingdom um, and the United States. For example, in the UK, Theresa May had a proposal in 2016 that, that has um, um, since been aborted. And Jeremy Corbyn um, likewise um, called for one third of worker elected directors in certain firms in a 2018 speech. And it's actually, exactly the institution will study in the context um, of Germany. That's a, a topic that has actually um, really regained uh, traction with a large article um, um, in The Guardian just a month or two ago, where many, um, many um, public intellectuals and researchers called for, um, you know, um, the democratization of um, the, the, work, uh, the workspace. And our paper seeks to shed light on the consequences of what uh, giving workers such control, control rights um, and uh, partial control of the firm does to outcomes. Now, what this institution actually does is subject to an open and I would argue unresolved debate. Um, on the one hand, um, I guess um, the core argument that proponents um, of this institution uh, make is that it's an institution that boosts worker bargaining power. So um, it's perhaps like the most direct way you give workers um, seats literally in the, um, you know, in the body, in the entity that um, makes decisions um, about the firm, about investment levels, about um, many other strategic decisions. And that is obviously a boost to worker bargaining power that many hope will lead to more rent sharing and an increase in wages. So as in, in that, our paper, um, or in assessing um, the extent to which this um, type of institution can fulfill that goal, our paper also speaks to an ongoing debate on the role of labor power and institutions in the decline of wages, in some cases relative wages, and rent sharing in particular, um, that has been, um, you know, proposed in recent, um, that has been debated in, in recent years. Now, there are also a couple of other mechanisms that will um, shed more light on towards the end of the paper. So for example, Hirschman's idea that giving workers voice can have beneficial effects on productivity or that giving workers um, a seat on the corporate board and information, kind of like a look at the, um, at the books of the firm, 
can also help with the enforcement of implicit contracts, which we could otherwise not write because um, we don't all see the observe the same um, signal. We'll leave that aside for now, but um, to show it well, um, we have that in mind and discuss it in the paper directly and also get back to it at the, um, at the end. This is uh, kind of like the more benign view of this institution, at least from a worker's perspective. We should expect to see um, increase in wages and perhaps firms sharing more rents with their workers. Now, what's the big um, economic counter argument? Um, the key objection is a model of this institution as one that induces holdup and underinvestment. So what's the idea here? It's a quintessential application of the holdup model in grout and related models. So the idea is, um, you know, we have a, sequ a sequential game. Um, first, the capitalists need to decide how much to invest. Then the workers um, and the capitalists get together and um, set wages. And the more workers have bargaining power in that stage, um, the higher the wages will be, the greater the share of the pie that the workers will reap. And capitalists anticipating that will cut back on investment. And that ultimately will lead to um, lower investment and perhaps even lower wages because we're operating off of a lower capital stock. It's very much related to the shareholder values view of this institution. So the fathers of the shareholder values view, Jensen and Meckling in a series of influential papers, discussed this very institution and viewed it as an agency cost that leads to disinvestment. Um, and we'll have um, some more information on what exactly they meant by that in just a couple of slides. Now, the ideal experiment we'd like to run is to randomly assign firms to shared governance. Now, that's not something that we have done, unfortunately, but um, we built on existing evidence um, that, um, for example, compares larger versus smaller firms in the context of German co-determination at a 2000 employee threshold, where firms um, above it have to have 50% of worker involvement and below that to have um, one third worker involvement. Now we go a slightly different route. Specifically, what we uh, bring to bear is quasi-experimental evidence on the causal effect of worker elected directors on the corporate board, on a variety of firm and worker level outcomes in particular will focus on wages, rent sharing, and capital formation as kind of like the basic tenets uh, or the basic um, dimensions through which this debate that I characterized on this previous slide will play out. So what we do is we exploit a cohort specific reform of shared governance in German stock corporations. And the variation we use is that there's a neat reform that we can leverage for identification. So um, those, that were incorporated before August 10th, 1994, had to apportion one third of their board seats to workers and workers could then freely elect uh, whom to send to these corporate boards. This um, regulation remains in place until today. So it got locked in even after the reform that we study. In contrast, um, there are firms or uh, stock corporations that were incorporated after, on or after August 10th, 1994, which um, have no mandate and in fact no right to put um, board seats or to give board seats to workers unless they grow relatively large, more than 500 employees. So we'll leverage this type of reform induced um, variation in um, our research design in two ways. So ultimately we'll do a difference in differences design in which we use sharp variation first along the incorporation date, so comparing firms that are slightly older and slightly younger uh, and were incorporated around the August 10th, 1994 cutoff. And then we'll have a second dimension in which we'll compare these firms before incorporated before and after, and we can track them um, with data, for example, up to today, to firms that are about the same age, also incorporated before and after, but are in a different class of corporations. And we'll also directly compare the, you know, do kind of like um, an RD lens at what happens when we just compare the firms incorporated before and after among the affected class of stock corporations. And then we'll bring rich firm board and administrative matched employer employee data to bear to see how this plays out um, empirically. Here's a, a brief overview of the remainder of the talk. So first I'll high level the rent sharing view and contrast the static bargaining model um, with the holdup model. Then we'll talk about institutions, reform, and the research design. I'm sure many of you have questions at this point. 
how exactly is this organized, we'll get there. Then we'll have the empirical results and conclude with a discussion of this institution and our findings. So the static bargaining view, the view that um, you can commonly hear uh, in the newspaper when people say, well, um, we should have this institution because it's good for worker bar uh, for rent sharing and also for worker wages. What is it um, based on in simple economics terms? Um, let's look at worker surplus as a function of wages, um, labor and the capital stock, which we've fixed here. That's why it's a static model. And um, here we um, have um, the worker surplus is a function of the size of the workforce L times W minus B where W is the wage and B is some outside option. Okay, so kind of like the rent that is earned by workers uh, working at this firm. The firm surplus, here we've put the capital cost to zero. We'll um, make that more general in just a bit. It's just uh, the gap between output, also many prices and wages. We then have, for example, the classic Nash solution for bargaining, um, which as a function of worker bargaining power phi, since wages equal to worker outside option B, plus a share of phi for each worker of average surplus. So the um, term here, the right-hand side is total surplus um, divided by um, the size of the workforce, okay? And what we see is that when we, in this model, uh, when we hold everything fixed and we raise worker bargaining power, almost by definition, we see wage increases, okay? So that is the um, dominant mechanism that is discussed when uh, we talk about why this institution may be good for workers. The key assumption here is that the size of the pie um, in this simple static view is fixed, okay? And here's where kind of like the classic view in economics, but also in corporate finance, corporate governance, or finance more generally comes in. It's a view of holdup that very much sees these inputs as endogenous to, for example, changes in worker bargaining power. And here we're quoting from the Jensen and Meckling 1979 paper, where they spoke specifically about German co-determination and wrote that upon gaining control of the firm, the workers will begin eating it up by transforming the assets of the firm into consumption or personal assets. And about the macro consequences of the institution, it will become difficult for the firm to obtain capital in private capital markets. The result of this process will be significant reduction in the country's capital stock, increased unemployment and reduced labor income. So in this formula, when we look at um, the effect of um, uh, increases in worker bargaining power through this lens on the wage, we still have this rent sharing effect, this direct static um, sense that I um, just described on the previous page. And then we have this additional holdup mechanism that um, acknowledges that capital will be endogenous to worker bargaining power. So the higher the worker bargaining power, um, at least in this model, the lower the capital will be that um, capitalists will invest in the firm. So um, just in a brief, like one minute um, highlight uh, or you know, high level um, summary of this model, the firm um, with the following time structure, this follows the Grout 1984 econometrica model, First, the firm chooses capital. Second, there's bargaining over wages. We'll solve it by backwards induction. So the firm is interested in profits, which are a function of revenue, the wage bill, and capital expenditure. Optimally, what the firm should be doing, if it faced no distortions, it would set the um, marginal product of capital equal to the cost of um, capital, FK being equal to C. The essence of holdup is that the wage is endogenous to K. So the firm instead sets um, the marginal product of K equal to C plus an additional term that um, you know, acknowledges or anticipates that the wage will be a function of K. So an underlying story could be, for example, wage bargaining. It could be rent sharing. And you know, the firm knows that if it becomes more profitable, if it creates a higher value added um, per worker, it needs to um, uh, share some of those rents with the workers. Then we have that in the first stage, the capital choice by the firm, um, for example, if we just um, plug in our Nash bargaining formula, um, will be distorted in the following way. Um, we have this additional term here that depends on basically the sunkedness of capital. So if the firm could freely sell capital again, we wouldn't see this. And this additional term that depends on worker bargaining power. And that, um, leads to the result that the firm will select a lower capital stock and a higher marginal product of capital and the bargaining power increase to workers will lower investment. And that in turn can have an effect on wages through a rent sharing mechanism, okay? And that's what we'll highlight um, 
as these are kind of like the dominant views in the literature. And, um, and we'll have a, a resolution towards the end where a generalization of the model can perhaps be, um, or is perhaps more um, able to explain the empirical patterns that we actually see in the data. On to um, institutions, the reform and the research design. So here's a brief primer on corporate governance in Germany when you don't have worker representation. So here's our corporation with the shareholders. The shareholders elect the supervisory board, which is kind of similar to a board of directors, for example, of the US um, corporation. The supervisory board is in charge of appointing, controlling, dismissing, and setting the compensation for the executive board. The executive board is the body of the firm that um, runs it on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's kind of the C-suite, the CEO, uh, the, the CFO, and so on. This board in turn reports back to the supervisory board, which is also involved in major decisions. So for example, large scale investments um, are typically have to go through the supervisory board, as well as outsourcing decisions, acquisition decisions, all of that. Now we'll contrast this type of governance setup with one which is slightly more complicated, where there's this additional arrow where the workforce elects one third of the members of the supervisory board. And um, once um, the workers are elected and are um, um, directors on the supervisory board, they basically are equals um, relative to the capital representatives at least in the corporations that we consider, they are elected in free and direct elections. And uh, importantly, um, in the corporations we'll consider, they are um, recruit, the, the worker director, uh, the worker elected directors themselves are recruited from among the workforce, recruited from and then selected from the workforce. So in very large corporations, there are also union outsiders. The union can um, send um, delegates to corporate boards. Here, we'll um, be looking at is um, studying a situation where it's insiders, insider um, worker directors. So our research design will contrast the situation on the left here, uh, where workers do have a board seat, with that on the right, where workers don't have such a board seat. And these will be the slightly older and these will be the slightly younger corporations. What is the ver specific variation that we um, leverage here? So we're talking about stock corporations and um, are displaying the share of workers on the board on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have the years uh, the um, the incorporation dates and um, this is a system that was in place um, basically since um, the end of um, World War II so um, the early 1950s essentially um, and um, in part um, around or um, already earlier and uh, was um, uh, in part a response to um, many people ask like why was this instituted in Germany in the late 1940s 1950s in part it was a response um, to kind of like the atrocities um, committed um, during the Nazi regime and the fact that the class of captains of industry was industries had been very much involved in the regime and um, the allies in particular the US um, pushed for worker representation because um, workers were relatively untainted at the same time, it happened against the backdrop of kind of a rising threat of the Cold War and um, a bit of a concession to workers to, you know, be involved in, to become involved in corporate governance rather than, you know, have even more, um, even stronger demands. And this has been a system um, at the time of the reform that we study that has been in, uh, in place for about 40, um, 45 years. Okay. So what happens in the reform in 1994? This um, policy gets abolished in new corporations. So corporations that are incorporated on or after the date that the reform comes in place do not have um, a mandate to put one third of their um, um, board seats to workers. And instead the mandate is zero unless the firm reaches a relatively high um, size of 500 employees, uh, which only about 12% of German corporations do. At the same time, the um, um, the worker representation in these slightly older corporations um, got locked in, got permanently locked in. Um, an important question is, um, does this um, lock-in actually bind? And we have a couple of pieces of um, information that suggests that it actually has a lot of bites. So one is um, de jure. Firms cannot simply say, we're shutting down business. 
and we're reincorporating tomorrow. And guess what? We're a new corporation. Well, they can do that, but they cannot um, evade um, the um, mandate of the law that would still consider them um, uh, technically an older corporation according to these um, statutes. And secondly, another indication that it actually bites is there have been lawsuits by shareholders of these slightly older um, corporations that are brought against either their corporation or the government that says this is unequal treatment. There, this is an arbitrary cutoff date. And why should we, a firm that was incorporated in the summer of 1994, uh, face very different governance structures compared to a firm that was in, um, or the, the firm that I have um, stock in, a very different governance structure compared to a firm that is, um, you know, also 20 years old now, but it is, um, you know, was incorporated in summer of 1995. Um, it turns out that the German um, Constitutional Court always, um, or in the, in the case that we're aware of, um, upheld this law and dismissed these lawsuits um, as late as, I think like five years ago. So it's still on the books and this grandfathering rule persists. It was, um, why, why was there um, um, this um, like grandfathering compromise? Um, it was a compromise between um, conservative and liberal or libertarian um, governing coalition and the social Democrats who held the opposition. Um, or who were the opposition, and the government wanted to abolish this type of um, corporate or shared governance in stock corporations of this size class across the board, regardless of incorporation date, but needed the votes of the Social Democrats, which held the upper chamber, the Bundesrat, and said, um, no, we're, you know, representing workers, so the workers, uh, we, we don't want to um, kick out any workers from boards, and so the compromise that was reached was then um, basically face saving to the social democrats. No active worker representatives of any existing corporations had to be kicked out. Whereas, you know, new corporations that were just being incorporated would not get, um, be subject to this, um, this mandate. And the classic case of political economy and um, grandfathering that um, can be the result of it. Okay. So what our research design will do is we'll um, first compare stock corporations uh, incorporated before versus after the reform. Um, in our main specifications, we'll use a two-year window, but we also vary it from one year to three years, for example. So this is our first dimension of difference. And um, for the outcomes where we find positive effects, we'll actually zoom in um, directly to see um, what's, um, what's driving this. We'll also have a second um, control group. Um, these are LLCs or GmbHs in um, German terminology, with roughly corresponding to um, the corporate form of an LLC, a limited liability company or corporation. What's interesting here is that for them, the shared governance rules were not affected because they were never subject to this mandate. And so no, no rules were um, changed as a consequence of this 1994 reform. And so we'll have them as an additional control group. And what's neat about it is that will allow us to have non-parametrically control for incorporation time effects. You could imagine that perhaps the structure of the economy changes from say like 1993 to 1995, and we'll be able to control for these incorporation date time effects um, when we control firms later on. So this is our second difference. And then, uh, well, um, our main specification will be a difference in differences of design where we compare the difference in outcomes, for example, today, uh, between older versus slightly younger um, stock corporations and compare and contrast it with the difference for older versus slightly younger LLCs. We'll bring several data sources um, to the table to analyze um, the results of this variation in the data. So first, Bureau of Dijk data. This is corporate financial and production data based on official registers and company reports. And we've actually expanded um, the standard one to also go back further in time. But the coverage of this data set starts um, only roughly in um, 2000. So everything that I will show you for these corporate outcomes will be conditional on firms surviving um, until uh, surviving for about five years. But we'll have um, an additional data set that can help, two additional data sets that can help us. Through. So first, we'll also work with the universe of German social security records. In particular, a cool new data set that has been matched or that has matched these um, types of employee, employer employee data that actually go back all the way in principle to 1975, matched to um, Bureau Van Dyke's Orbis data set. So our um, corporate um, 
data set. And then finally, we'll have several additional data sources. Just highlight one here, the Mannheim Enterprise Panel, which is nice because it goes back all the way to um, 1990, um, actually before the reform, I think 1992, and allows us to view um, all incorporations and exits of our um, kind of like um, um, incorporated firms, actually starting in 1991, even better. So we use this data set, the uh, uh, Mannheim Enterprise Panel, to um, first study um, kind of like what are the effects on firm survival. And that's what I'm showing you um, as these here are plot diff and diff coefficients. Um, and um, for now, let's focus on the exit probability. Um, for example, 20 years later, we essentially um, do not find um, statistically um, significant differences in these slightly older versus slightly younger stock corporations. Um, I'm showing you this here because um, this can assuage some doubts that essentially by looking at corporate outcomes from 2000 onwards, we're looking at a very um, skewed sample. So it looks like um, there's no um, um, differential attrition. Um, okay, so a couple of other checks on um, the research Brian? design. Which, yes. On, on, on the exit probability, so the, the confidence bands, I presume, are point-wise. Uh, yes. Displaying because you know you do have a slight positive effect year after year. Um, uh, yeah. For twenty years. We could check for that. Um, yes. Um, although basically our um, so our data will start here, um, roughly for the most uh, for um, for most firms. Um, but we can we can check for that and then also quantitatively um, assess. Um, if we take the point estimate seriously, what um, uh, what type of selection, for example, um, should we ex um, should we expect? I think that would be the the right way to um, yeah. to tackle this potential concern. Yeah. Also, just quickly tell us what which direction is the effect size? Which which firm is on the left? Which firm is on the right? Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, new rearrangement of the um, of the of the slides that uh, omitted this. This means that. Um, the um, slightly older um, corporations subject to the mandate um, have a slightly higher overall um, um, exit rate. We have this um, other outcome here, the bankruptcy probability, that is slightly lower. Um, I mean, statistically significant in one year. Um, again, as Steve uh, suggested, perhaps we should also pool it and um, increase our power perhaps to detect, um, to detect effects here. Although the outcomes are of course like very correlated over time. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it in, in any case. So a couple more checks on the research design, uh, which will you know, live off a of variation of firms incorporated before and after. One thing we'll be looking at is um, a McCrary test where we compare incorporations of stock corporations before and after. And one potential worry is that firms, in particular those, so we have like months relative to August 10th, 1994, so the cutoff date on the x-axis. Uh, one potential concern is that firms that learn of the possibility to uh, perhaps delay incorporation um, and then not be subject to this mandate would not um, want to incorporate here and instead incorporate slightly later um, when um, you know, they would not fall under this mandate. In terms of at least close to this continuity, this is where basically the law was, um, the existence of this grandfathering rule was announced. We don't see those effects. If anything, it looks roughly similar to me. And formally, we can't reject uh, in a McCrary test that these um, densities are continuous here at the um, policy discontinuity. Um, we also looked at um, the differential, whether there's differential selection into stock corporations. So this is the proportion of um, firms of corporations that incorporate as a stock corporation. And that looks like it trends up over time um, moderately, but there doesn't seem to be a trend break or an increase here um, around the time of the policy discontinuity. So formally we have a regression specification where we assess exactly that. Um, also one additional check we do in the paper for our diff and diff design is um, one may worry that um, perhaps there's, you know, we didn't say, uh, see any change at the discontinuity. So we didn't see firms um, bunching um, right after, for example, or missing mass of firms just before the 1994 or in general before the 1994 um, cutoff. So 
uh, one potential um, concern um, would be that um, the firms um, uh, kind of like change in, um, and also I see um, uh, a question, a raised hand. Yes, uh, this is me, Ivan. Um, a clarifying question, really. Yes. Uh, this goes mm -hmm. back to earlier on the validity of the, uh, you know, the way you're estimating it. So you spent some time sure. showing that the companies did not just like, you know, uh, decorporate and reincorporate overnight. Uh, they couldn't get out of this policy. But another mm -hmm. question is whether companies uh, strategically delayed the corporation and that affects the composition of the companies that were, you know, chose to wait rather than, or perhaps some other companies chose to incorporate earlier. Um, yep. so do you have any, can you say anything about that? Because that's kind of like the other side of the coin, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually, this very slide, I hope, um, will speak um, to this um, question directly. So first, I think in terms of the strategic delay, we already saw the, um, the density plot, right, and the non-parametrically um, binned um, data, where we saw that um, essentially we didn't see a missing mass and a strategic delay, at least on average. But what could still happen is that we see differences in um, characteristics um, over time. So here we check whether for example, the industry composition changes. And rather than um, you know, just relying on kind of controlling for industry, we use it here as, a, um, uh, as outcome variable. So we use this outcome variable in cooperation in the particular industry, and then apply our um, standard um, diff and diff design. Um, and this is the coefficient on um, the, uh, for, the corporate, uh, for the firms that were um, forced to have workers on the board. And essentially none of these is individually significant. And here, um, I hope Steve um, will be more pleased um, with us uh, on this graph. We also tested the joint um, significance um, and the p-value for the joint significance test here is 0.97. So far from a significance level. So we um, did not do not see any um, symptoms of um, selection, at least when we study the, well, in terms of these observables that we study. But of course we can't, um, you know, the, caveat applies, of course, that we can't see um, potential other um, unobservables that may matter. This is a first stage graph where we um, just compare um, the stock corporations incorporated before um, versus um, after the 1994 cutoff date. And this is just, um, uh, supposed to show that um, we actually do see a sizable change in the share of workers that actually sit on the supervisory board. For illustration purposes, we hear, rather than the rest of the um, talk where we don't condition on firm size, we um, zoomed in on um, the, um, I think, uh, roughly 80% of firms that stay below 500. And I think we have a little bit of measurement error in this data set. Um, there's a different data set um, that has like um, the exact composition of corporate boards, the Hoppenstedt Aktienführer, um, where employment is perhaps not that well measured. Incorporation date is because that's um, kind of like legally available in um, company records. Um, that's why we see like perhaps it's like slight um, non-zero um, effect. In any case, a large shift in kind of like the first stage of like, what is the share of workers that sit on these corporate boards? In the main paper, we also have um, like a large um, section on um, kind of like a board demographics that we'll skip over here. So in terms of the empirical- Simon, results, just a question related to the number of representative of workers. So yep. this is a third. Now, uh, yep. I learned sometime that uh, median voters uh, play the game. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm just asking, I'm not asking the question, is there anything that could happen? I can imagine mm -hmm. just different channels. That one is information, the other one is bargaining. Yeah, so I think um, it's, um, it's a good point. We'll close with that discussion just very briefly. I think the okay. way I think about it is kind of in like a, no, an wait. Aguillon Tirol type of model of like, formal authority and um, like real authority, I guess. And formally, I guess, um, the firms could always outvote um, the workers. Um, so that would mean perhaps just the information effect um, survives. In fact, what we see in equilibrium is actually the, these boards in, um, I mean, this is not very representative, but you know, in scholars of industrial relations who have studied the system basically find that close to all of the decisions that these types of boards take are unanimous. So the norm that has evolved is that one, uh, one negotiates until one reaches the compromise. There's of course an equilibrium outcome and perhaps you know, workers anticipate that if we really pushed for 
very big um, changes, perhaps, you know, we would be outvoted. So it's a, perhaps a, an equilibrium that, is, that evolves that, has, um, that is um, cooperative. So I think I have just 10 minutes left. Is that right? So I'll um, uh, push ahead um, with, um, with the results and we'll start with wages. Um, so these are our um, diff and diff coefficients, but what's the effect of uh, worker representation on wages? In this case, just um, log of mean wages at the firm where we see roughly a 4% um, increase, but um, it's potentially driven by a selection of workers and a true pay premium. So we also analyze um, AKM, about Cromartz, Margolis uh, type of um, pay premium of firms where we control for worker effects. And in this case, um, for example, put the firm effect, the pay premium on the left-hand side. And there we see a roughly one to 2% increase, but cannot reject significance. So what's interesting here is that um, this institution does not, at least on average, seem to um, lead to a wage increase. And we can reject, um, for, uh, for example, wage pre uh, pay premium increases of more than 6%. We've also studied um, inequality within the firm, and it doesn't seem to, there's, it doesn't seem to be much that's um, going on there. One crucial feature um, of um, these models that I've described is that they're models of rent sharing. Um, so recall that the Nash solution for the wage bargain had that the wages were a function of the outside option plus worker bargaining power times average surplus. So total surplus divided by um, uh, the size of the workforce. We'll test for that directly empirically by relating um, shifts in value added per worker to um, changes um, in the pay premium. Um, and um, that ought to identify um, the worker bargaining power parameter. And then we're interested in whether firms that have workers on the corporate board are more likely to share um, rents with workers, so have a higher phi coefficient. And here we do this um, first on average. Um, so we relate, um, in this case, for example, the um, firm fixed effect in terms of log wages to, um, the, um, to labor, average labor productivity, so log value added per worker. This is for the German labor market, we see a slope of about 0.09, kind of standard in the, when, one, when one surveys the literature when this has been done in other countries. The crucial question for us is, does this differ for our um, different corporation types? And this um, is what this like, messy graph um, shows. Um, this is um, one to show the data directly, data points for the, the rent sharing. And essentially in a difference and differences sense, the answer is no we do not see an effect on um, um, rent sharing. So this institution does not um, change uh, what we think of as the parameter for phi, okay? So in the um, last um, section mm -hmm. of the main results, we'll go back to hold up. Sorry, uh, I don't know if I should. Yes, Francis. Uh, yeah. The equation you have on wage is in levels. Yep. The AKM stuff, which we all love, is in logs. Mm -hmm. Should you do some transformation of the wage to be able to estimate? Yes. So if we wanted to, yes. So if you if we wanted to estimate the Nash bargaining parameter, for example, we yeah. should um, do it. Uh, absolutely, we should do it in levels. Here, where uh, what we did is basically estimate rent sharing elasticities, um, which I guess are um, germane to like other models. For example, um, wage posting monopsony models often have that feature. Uh, you are com uh, completely correct uh, that this does not actually identify um, the, or we, you know, we'd have to, it is related to, and we'd have to like transform it because one is an elasticity, the other one isn't, um, the um, Nash bargaining power um, parameter. I did something um, slightly uh, not innocuous on the previous, uh, on the previous slide. Um, thanks for catching me. Um, so now we'll, um, we'll look at uh, what happens to capital and, um, the big worry um, with this institution is it's an institution that de um, depresses the, um, the capital stock. Okay, here's um, our simple RD, um, for example, for fixed assets, um, log fixed assets, actually. Um, fixed assets are um, basically what we think of as a proxy for productive capital. So this is, um, for example, um, machines, equipment, buildings, and so on. It doesn't include um, current assets so, such as cash. So we can think of this as a proxy for how, ma uh, how many machines does the firm roughly have around. And here I'm uh, plotting the um, RD for fixed assets where we see the slightly older corporations, which have a substantially higher uh, 
level of fixed assets compared to the slightly younger stock corporations, which don't have um, shared governance. And we can do the same difference for these other corporation types, which are different um, in terms of levels, but actually so uh, we see no, um, no change at the discontinuity at all. Because we, we do find positive effects here, we wanna be sure that we actually, um, this is not an artifact um, of, the, of the data. So we slice uh, the data in a variety of ways, which I'll skip over for now to just um, give you an overview of um, our main findings. So we find a higher capital intent. These are again, our difference in differences coefficients. We find higher um, um, fixed assets per employee. Here um, on the left-hand side, we plot it in levels. On the right-hand side, in blocks. This actually translates into higher labor productivity. So value added per worker is higher. Um, marginally significant for log value added um, per worker. So it's not the case that this additional capital is unproductive or entirely unproductive. It's just a new cafeteria, for example. It does look like the firms uh, produce more as a consequence of having more capital around. We um, studied a proxy or a measure for TFP, total factor productivity. There we actually don't see any negative effects. So some people had hopes that this is an institution that really boosts productivity. Others were worried that this is something that is a drag on productivity. For example, if the capital is not productive, we don't find any indication that TFP is moved one way or the other. And this is, um, please look at the right-hand scale, uh, scale here. This is the change in the capital share. And this is uh, perhaps one of the most interesting results we see because these firms that have workers on the board actually become more capital intensive as proxied for by the capital share. So many have mentioned perhaps this is an institution that you know, can boost worker wages and actually increase the labor share. This capital share is like one minus um, the labor share. It turns out it actually, um, it's the opposite. We saw wages aren't affected, but the firms become more capital intensive. So actually um, as a, in this, um, um, you know, in, in terms of like how factors get, um, get paid, this is something that um, leads to um, a higher capital stock and that um, gets uh, reflected in the compensation that goes to capital. One quick question. Okay. Do you have information on other outcomes, for example, distribution of dividends to shareholders? Because if you think in practice, what may yeah. happen in the boardroom, if you have to vote between distributing dividends or investing within the firm, this is a situation in which maybe the labor representation may tilt the decision towards physical investment, right? Absolutely. So, um, in, at least um, I, I won't get into like, kind of like the, the legal details, which are um, slightly more complicated in Germany. But that's precisely um, that's precisely the trade-off that I think um, that we um, um, that we think is going on. And this is that we don't see dividend payouts um, directly. We can look at measures of like net income and other profit measures. I'm not showing here, it's in the paper. We basically don't see shifts there. Um, we are um, looking to, um, you know, we're running this um, analysis in other settings where we perhaps can see dividends um, to shed more light on um, um, precisely this mechanism. But here, um, we, um, we don't have the, we basically don't have the right. data. We don't see because an effect in the sense, of profits. If you think about the vote, uh, yeah. and the one server, you want to think was the counterfactual to various decisions, I mean, it, yeah. Absolutely. No, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a good point. Last empirical um, result is we see a higher in-house share of production. So value added, the share of revenue that gets produced in-house, so value added divided by revenue goes up. And that is um, perhaps one of the mechanisms that's very much consistent with the narratives of this institution that perhaps worker representatives push for more in-house production rather than uh, outsourcing parts of the production process, uh, for example, to suppliers abroad. And that um, uh, seems to account for why these firms have, uh, or it seems to be one important mechanism why these firms have more um, revenue, oh, sorry, more um, fixed assets, uh, more machines and uh, more equipment around. Do a bunch of placebo analyses um, where we don't see um, uh, in, you know, size of, um, you know, similarly sized um, effects. Okay, let me conclude. So to take stock, we found that shared governance does not raise wages or worker bargaining power in wage settings. Uh, we found no evidence for um, large wage increases, no evidence on uh, wage structure effects, and no evidence for rent sharing shifts. Um, and um, as Francis uh, pointed out, we should perhaps also transform our um, zero into a um, um, Nash bargaining power parameter, which I um, imagine will also remain zero. This is a direct rejection of um, holdup and um, disinvestment induced by increase in worker bargaining power. 
very much consistent with a paper by Carr, De Vicenti, and uh, Maida, and um, restart in 2013. Instead, we see increases in capital intensity and higher value added per worker, but no you know, magical shifts in uh, total factor productivity. Um, we also found, and this goes kind of to your question, uh, around no um, evidence that, um, at least based on the data that we have, that shareholders are hurt. Um, first, um, by revealed preference, we find no avoidance by firms, so no ma manipulation behavior around the reform. What we also study is whether firms bunch below the 500 cutoff, and we found no evidence for that either. And um, what I haven't shown you is um, absence of effects on, product, uh, on profits um, with relatively uh, tight standard errors. So why do we, um, um, it's out of time, so why do we see no wage effects? So one is that there's a fiduciary duty of worker representatives to the firm. Um, it's perhaps a you know, formalistic um, explanation. But also, and this goes back to the question that Raphael um, raised, um, this minority involvement of workers in the firm may actually tame labor because workers you know, may realize that if we were radicals, we could always be outvoted by the majority. So in order to actually exert any influence and wield power um, and you know, affect outcome, those outcomes that we um, care about, we ha perhaps have to moderate our um, demands in other dimensions, very much consistent with kind of like narratives one hears um, from German um, board members, um, uh, several of which we've um, talked with. One potential objection is that wages are perhaps set centrally and there's little room to deviate. But in practice, there are several papers, for example, by Carton co-authors or um, by Uta, who was um, the first speaker here, actually shows that the German labor market does have a lot of flexibility and a lot of room for um, decentralized um, wage setting. So to conclude, what can perhaps account for our evidence uh, um, in particular also the positive effects on capital, perhaps this is an institution that leads to more cooperative solutions, perhaps through these repeated interactions and communications, which we know kind of game theory and um, you know, studies of um, cooperative behavior can foster more cooperation. Um, in the paper, we also go through a simple model building on some work by Alan Manning, who's I think the next speaker, where we show that increasing worker bargaining power over input choices rather than over wages actually can push towards higher investment. So uh, in that model, and um, perhaps as an empirical matter as well, workers may have a long horizon and a preference uh, for capital investment. I'll just conclude with a quote by one very influential worker board representative who wrote when, uh, when asked about what, is, what does this institution do according to your view? It's like the focus is on the long-term security of the company through investments and innovations involving the employees. And what's left out here is, is it's not an institution that he views as you know, the primary um, you know, lever to increase um, compensation. And with that, I'll conclude. And thank you very much for the, um, for the questions and for the um, discussion and uh, for your attention. So thank you, Simon.